Well, praise the Lord and welcome once again to another Wednesday night Bible study here at Living Faith Christian Center. I pray that you've had a blessed and highly favored day and the goodness of the Lord is shining over your life and we just stand in agreement with you for the very best of the kingdom of God to you and to yours. Let's begin the study with prayer. Heavenly Father, we just give you the glory, the honor uh, for being the King and Lord of our lives. Thank you for the gift of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, who leads, guides, and teaches us all truths in your kingdom, Lord. We thank you for the body of believers, Lord, and as we study, Lord, we grow in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, we're, we're in the final portion of a subject we've been dealing with the last two weeks, divine guidance. And so the subtitle will be uh, how to be led by the Spirit or being led by the Spirit. And it's a term that is used, and we'll get into it a little uh, deeper and, and talk about some of the nuance of being led by the Spirit. What does that really mean? How, how do we interact? How, how do I separate just from my mentality versus my spirit or the Holy Spirit? And so we have all of these uh, in conjunction. There are no separate compartments, uh, but they have their separate function. And so where the word leads us and guides us, those are always very, very safe places. Uh, we said on last week, God does not want us to struggle in our Christianity, but lead us to prosper in it. You know, he gives us all things to uh, richly enjoy in the kingdom of God. He leads us in a way uh, to a plain path. He leads us always into good things. So how do we do uh, living in the world that we live in how do we take advantage of not only is eternal life when I die and I go to be with God, but while I'm living on the planet, uh, how do I take advantage of what God has provided for every believer who seeks him, uh, this personal connection, uh, this divine connection with him uh, that gives us the best opportunity for life and godliness. So. Uh, because God is a spirit, John 4.24, God is a spirit. Uh, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we are connecting with the nature uh, and, and the very existence of God when we say that we are connecting with uh, the spirit. And he, of course we know the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, so we kind of use the terms interchangeably, but you know, uniquely uh, we teach and believe this is scriptural uh, mandate of recognizing Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we say we are led by the Spirit, then the Holy Spirit of God is assigned to us uh, in the new birth. We are born of that Spirit and because of the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But then there's an ongoing maturing, leading, teaching, and guiding us is what we look forward to in our relationship as we talk about the Spirit of God. How do we come from living that uh, uh, self-centered life, not, not necessarily in a bad way, but when you're not saved, you go by your intellect, your intuition, all of the natural things that any human being has at their disposal, and then once I'm saved, born again, filled with the Spirit, how now does my life uh, become different in how I uh, navigate uh, the same life issues and things that anybody else in the world has to deal with. Uh, Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So two people can look at it, the same situation, and come away with two separate, separate things. There's a way that seems right unto a man. So this is talking about that natural man. Uh, absolutely believe that they're right 100 percent ready to die for it if they get it but god said these are the ways of death so he's drawing the comparison between the ways of god and the ways of man some things seem right to mankind humanity flesh unsaved man carnal uh, the other side is the kingdom of god that's rooted grounded in the person of the lord jesus christ so when we draw the comparison here when we're born again, we want to lean not to that old man. And uh, uh, the, the proverb said, lean not to that own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge God. So that is 
you know, we get saved, so you don't throw away your brain. You, some of those thoughts still live there. Some of that information still lives there. But as I'm trained to recognize and to be led by the Spirit, then my conduct, behavior, my uh, reasoning, all those things are, are going to mirror that which is uh, scriptural and spiritual. And it's, and it's one of the challenges for uh, people when they've been exposed to a lot of things in the world is there is no switch. You don't just turn a switch, or oh, I'm born again, guess what? E everything has changed. Um, Romans 12 talks about uh, being renewed in your mind, in the spirit of your mind, being renewed in the spirit, being renewed in the word, uh, that, that transformation takes place. You're not the old man but the new man. And so this is why uh, First Peter says that we desire, babes desire the sense of milk of the word. Why? It, it gives you what you wouldn't give a newborn natural baby steak or so solid food. You start on milk. And so then you gravitate to a more solid diet. Well, the fundamentals of the kingdom of God is considered milk. They're palatable, digestible for literally anyone across the board. You don't need high levels of learning and exegesis to really understand what is the Bible talking about. That there's a simple right and wrong. That there's a God and the devil. There's a spirit and the flesh. So, so all these uh, superlatives that, that talk about the antithesis of one side or the other now points us to in the spirit and those of us who are born again we want to live after the spirit and not after the flesh so now here it comes uh, this is why we have to teach it but as you read it as you meditate as you learn god as you learn the spirit of god and we always relate it to natural friendship some people are just acquaintance some people i know them i don't know their name some people i know their name I don't know anything else about them. Some people I know a few little things about it, but I don't know them intimately. Then there are some people I've been knowing all my life. I know everything about them. They know everything about me as much as a human person can know. So there's levels of, of knowledge, intimacy, relationship, all these things in the natural, likewise in the spirit. You have to get to know God. You, know, you have to take his yoke upon you and learn of him is the admonition that Jesus gets, you know, learning is a process. Can't lay, lay hands on you to know everything about the kingdom of God, no. Study to show yourself approved, a workman of God. Rightly divide the word of truth. So I have to dig, I have to study, I have to meditate, and it gets you there. So as a young believer, I say don't be frustrated. Uh, don't be disappointed in yourself. You have to grow in the grace of God. Uh, as a mature believer and a maturing believer, uh, we have a responsibility to help others along in their walk with God, and, and we get a chance to be of service uh, to the kingdom of God, to be able to help and to be a blessing and to take advantage of things that God has shown us. How do we help others as well in the kingdom? All right? And then the scripture in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 8, verse 14, and it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And of course, uh, Paul writes this in his uh, dissertation in this por portion of writing uh, about life in the spirit. How do we live the life in the spirit? Uh, with um, this understanding of transformation because he's writing to the Romans who are his countrymen and then have, having you know, practiced Judaism, but now Christianity are that open relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection, this is what they're confronting. So the whole structure is, is, is new to them and then becoming acquainted uh, because many things, they just live structurally. They just live uh, ritually uh, through the, uh, the priest, the high priest, sacrifices, all those kind of things. Now when you're born again, Christ comes to live inside of you. So I'm not doing all those regimented things that I did before. I get to have a personal, uh, the Bible calls it the veil of the temple being written to, symbolic of Christ coming and live. You don't need an intermediary for you. Christ becomes the mediator between God and man. Now, uh, he, he used this statement, for as many as are led by the Spirit, mean there's a willingness. 
uh, I guess you can be a carnal believer and a reprobate believer or, uh, or resistant. And of course, again, we acknowledge the maturing. Um, you have to learn how to be led by the Spirit. You have to grow in the wisdom of God in being led by the Spirit. Sometimes we're disappointed, disappointed when we fail to be led by God because you they have a negative consequence. Sometimes God is trying to show us things and, and we miss it because we might lean to our old nature or logic or, or what seems that, you know, what the whole world is doing, whereas the voice of the Holy Spirit, he's there and sometimes it seems to be a faint voice, but we tune our ear in. So just like we know how to listen for certain things in the world, we have to learn how to listen for our Heavenly Father speaking by way of the Spirit. And here he, he draws the contrast um, in, in this uh, scripture about, uh, it, it literally says about your sonship, your willingness to be led by the Spirit. So I might not be perfect in it, but as a son of God, uh, uh, like he speaks in John chapter one uh, to them who believe to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So the sons of God, believers, born again uh, believers, even if we're, you know, immature Christians, beginning Christian, it's still a standard that you should be led by the Spirit. All right? Uh, so it's going to be available to you, and that's why we teach it divine guidance. All right. Now, uh, part of how we do this, um, of course we study, of course we meditate, but then in your prayer life. And so if we focus on that uh, just for a little bit, prayers for guidance. Now we remember um, what's called the prayer of consecration where Jesus was praying in the garden. He was wanting his father to lead him. And of course, this is a you know great, uh, uh, powerful moment in, in the course of human and kingdom history. Jesus is in the garden. He knows because he's been teaching and preaching that he has to die. He has to be crucified. He has to be buried. He has to be raised up three days later. He went over and over and over telling them. But it, it gives us an understanding of how, how do we navigate difficult times? How, how do we navigate? I know it's the will of God, but, but I'm in this human flesh, and sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm really trying to vacillate and not that... Jesus was struggling with it, but, but he, was, he, he was man and he was God. So just what our flesh would do if we knew we had to go through all those things, whatever level of apprehension, that's from our natural side. And the Bible clearly shows Jesus Christ exhibiting the, the very things that a human would go through here. But in the prayer, Jesus says, uh, when, when he's talking to God about letting the cup pass. That was his humanity. Uh, the, the Christ, the Savior, the Spirit of God is not saying he doesn't want to go to Calvary, but Jesus, Mary's baby, that Joseph's son, that's the one saying, if it's possible, let the cup, because it was the anguish of Christ and the suffering that he would have to endure, and really the the type of suffering, because the Bible said he became sin, not a sinner, but he became sin. It was the wrath of God that, that had to be projected on him because of the price. When we talk about the word perpetuation, we use it quite frequently. It's a term uh, in biblical study that literally he becomes the proper and the meat sacrifice acceptable to God. Under old Judaism, of course, you had the lamb that would be examined. Uh, we saw it in Exodus chapter 12. It, it was the precursor. That's why the Passover is built on that. God released the people because of the lamb and because of the blood. Fast forward to the time of Christ. It, he is the lamb of God who taken away the sins of the world. That's what John called him. And, and it is because of his blood. Now, it's how he has to give his blood. He doesn't just go and say, well, you know, cut me, let me bleed, stick me, let me bleed. It was the whole ordeal that the wrath of man sin, because God said, if you sin, if you rebel, you shall surely die. And that's what Adam put on all mankind. So the weight of Adam's sin has been passed down through every generation. And the only provision for lifting this 
is the suffering of our Jesus Christ. It's not just him dying, but the suffering. And the suffering is not because he couldn't endure uh, the 39 lashes or the piercing or, or marring him uh, beyond what any man was. It was the sin. It was becoming sin. It was the weight and the power. It just let us know how terrible sin is that our Christ had to endure such a thing and that it was repulsive to him even to the point of asking God, if it's possible, let the cup pass from it. But then he says immediately, nevertheless, not my will. So the will of Christ, his natural human will that's living inside it, in this body, is saying, this is something that I'm not relishing. But because of what this sacrifice is going to provide, let your will be done. And so in our own lives, we can mimic what Jesus does. Yeah, sometimes things are uncomfortable for us, difficult for us, surely not on the same level, but Lord, let your will be done. That There's a help, there's a blessing, and there's a refreshing that comes from God when we allow the will of God. You might go through your crucifixion, but praise the Lord, God will make sure there are some resurrections to follow. And, and so this is one of the most... Uh, touching points, I believe, when it said he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities, that I can say my Savior identified with me in such a way, and, and that the sacrifice, when we talk about what the Lord has done for me, is not just a house, a car, give you some money, or a answer the prayer over here, but, but I count the value of my relationship with Christ on what he gave me that I could not give for myself. I could not have provided it for God, even though I knew what was the requirement to release me from the power of sin. That was no way me or anybody else could pay their own sin debt. Jesus was the only one free, pure of sin, who could offer himself. He did it willingly so that I would have everlasting life in yourself as well. That's enough to give God a praise right there. Amen? Now. In, in the same passage, um, and it ties in with what I'll share a little bit later, but let's go ahead while we have our Bibles open to the book of Romans. Let, let's look at verse uh, 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So we just talked about uh, Jesus praying and asking, but he says, you know, praying exactly perfectly to God sometimes gets past us. Uh, but the Spirit, the Spirit himself, King James say itself, New King James say himself, because the Spirit is it's, it's, it's God, third person, uh, makes intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. So here is a place of divine guidance through the power of the Holy Spirit. So as I'm praying, and we'll touch a little bit later in the lesson. As I'm praying, the Holy Spirit is praying with me because the Holy Spirit, when you're born again, he becomes one with your spirit. It is that born again spirit redeemed. You are still you. You still have your own spirit, but the Holy Spirit now comes indivisible in you. He doesn't come in and out. He doesn't just come in on church service. You are born of the spirit, quickened in the spirit, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hey, man, it's, you know, how, how does it all work mechanically and physically? I don't know. But I believe what the Word of God says, and of course, anybody who's experienced a new birth, you know that God lives on the inside. From the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, uh, they live from the outside. In the New Testament, we live from the inside out, okay? And then it talks about the Holy Spirit uh, in, in a way of guiding Verse 27, and he that searcheth the heart, talking about the Spirit, knows what is the mind of God, what is the mind of the Spirit, because he make intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So now we see that when you are praying, the Holy Spirit inside of you is praying likewise. Now, again, mechanically and technically, uh, I, I can't give you the exact on it, because we just have to trust what the Bible says. You're praying, the Holy Spirit is praying in you. Why? Because God wants a good outcome for you. Don't ever, ever think that you are by yourself. 
God is in you, the Holy Spirit is in you, praying through you. And so forth, particularly uh, the, the way that we believe scripturally that that uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us that not only the dunamis of the Bible, but all the gifting available uh, to believers who submit to uh, what, what the scriptures say about being filled with the Spirit, be ye filled with the Spirit. Okay, now, and then um, when we understand this, now I can lean on him. I, I can lean into him. Not Now I can, in my meditation, it's not coming up with something good in my mind, but something good in my spirit. So now I'm, I'm meditating on the word, but that word and my prayer and, and, and my uh, prayer in the spirit is, is going to produce something that's in line with the will of God. And this is uh, the, the, the total, and, and really if you think about the proper outcome, uh, when we ask God to lead us or show us or whatever, it's, it's always based on something that's uh, desirable for our lives. We, we may not know everything, but we do want a good outcome. We do pray for good things to happen. We pray for things to happen uh, to those in our circle, whether it be family or close friends or members or, or, or in fellowship, etc. cetera. Uh, the Holy Spirit in our relationship is trying to get us to, to the very thing that we would desire our own self. Okay, good. Now, so let's talk about prayers for guidance. And, and we mentioned that one just to get us kicked off. Psalm 143.10. And we'll just give you a, a, a few scriptures uh, to look at. Teach me to do thy will. And, and think about the psalmist now. This is Old Testament. Teach me to do thy will. For thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Not just a physical place, but a spiritual place. That no matter what's going on around you, we want God to bring us to that place. You might have chaos and turmoil all around you. Guess what? You still can be in perfect peace. The Bible says if you keep your mind on him, he will keep you in perfect peace. Even a man's enemies are at peace when our minds are on the Lord. Hallelujah. And so... Here is a petition. It is a prayer petition. God, teach me how to do your will. Lead me, Lord God. Be, lead me by your spirit. Lead me by your word. Lead me by uh, your, your inward desires for my life. And this is what I believe most believers really, really want in our life. Because we have to navigate uh, two and three things at the same time. We have our spiritual relationship with God, and that's on one track. But I also have my daily interactions, whether it's family, job, all those kind of things, and then my other connection as I uh, meet and navigate in the world. So I have all these things going on, and most of them, I don't know how it's going to present itself before it presents itself, but my prayer is, God, you teach me, you lead me. Why? So, so when I encounter these things, I always want to be able to represent the kingdom of God. I always want to be able to come out in the way that God desires. I always want to be prepared uh, because I don't know what things negatively are going to show up. So I'm saying my best opportunity to come out successful and, and, and blessed in it is to have the Lord impart in me the way that I should go. Okay, uh, verse uh, Psalm 25. And a certain uh, passage here of um, the scriptures, beginning with verse 5, he said, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for thou have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions, according to thy mercy. Remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. I mean, that's a great testimony. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. And of course, we attribute this to David. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths, this is where I want to close with this. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep what? 
his covenant and his testimonies. This is the will of God concerning our lives in Christ Jesus. He will keep that which concerneth you. He is proactive. God is involved. He, you know, sometimes we say, oh, where is God? I don't know if I'm going through this, and I don't know, don't feel like I feel God. Trust me, it, it is his good pleasure. It is his desire. God is there, and we just have to open our hearts and, and make ourselves uh, uh, aware of the fact that he is there. Never leave us, never forsake us in any way. And then in Psalm 27, Verse 11, and the Psalm of David says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. Not just thy ways, but the way of the Lord. And lead me to a plain path because of mine enemies. Um, and I love verse 13. He said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And so in this whole passage, uh, David is dealing with all these peripheral things in his life, all the circumference, all the issues that's around him. And we still have a mandate, we still have a responsibility, we have our duties that we have to do, and guess what? We need the Lord to help us. And David was, like, like others as well, very, very um, quick to ask God to be involved with him, to help him, and lean and depend on that relationship. And uh, as with David, uh, he, his was very unique. Others, too, that have this close, close relationship with God that no matter what it is or what comes against you, you always felt that you were going to come out good because the Lord was on your side. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, uh, let's talk about how to listen with your spirit, listening with your spirit. So as believers, th these are things that we teach. Uh, you, you're going to be aware of them as you read the Bible and study and hear the word taught. But, but let's focus on the points uh, for, for the lesson today. Uh, number one, your conscience is recognizing your conscience is the voice of your spirit. So how do I hear my spirit? How do I hear the spirit of God living in me? How, how do I translate? What, what is the mechanism that says, okay, good, what well, God is telling me to do this? Because we hear people all the time saying, well, you know, the Lord told me, and it's far from what the Lord says, biblically and scripturally. But God is aware of your physical, uh, psychological makeup. So everything that makes you uh, mind, body, and spirit uh, God is aware of it, and because he, he immerses himself in, in all parts of our being, then it's to our advantage uh, for the communication. Now, when, when people say, well, you know, I heard the Lord and I heard him audibly, well, God doesn't always have to make a sound from heaven. Your, your ears, your human ears and how it works, we're not trying to get technical and all that, but those sounds, all those natural sounds, carnal, earthly, regular sounds come into the ear because God is spirit. He is speaking to us all the time when you can't hear a audible sound. A audible sound, anybody could hear it. But the voice of God is directed primarily to the believer. Not because he can speak to the, uh, uh, any, any evil person he wants to, but for the sake of the lesson, let's say that God is speaking. So then what we call our conscious or that, or that inward voice that lives inside of us. And, and, and sometimes it's magnified when you're really trying to make a decision on something. And, and you know, we, we're really thinking, meditating, all those things. And, and it's like, well, you know, one mind said this, another mind said that. We, we call that your conscious. Now, your conscious, uh, which the Bible uses one term uh, when, when you just become reparate against God, is like your conscience gets seared with a hot iron when you lose that sensitivity and connectivity. But here, just on a basic, when, and we're talking about your born-again conscious, so your other conscious is, is predicated on any number of things. It could be your upbringing, your education, your environment, and all of this. You know, even folks who are not saved, you know, we might use the term, your conscious was eating at you. In other words, you know, you couldn't just do something wrong to a person. Psychologically, it would just bother you. Okay, that's, that's your human 
natural conscious. When we talk about being led by the spirit, now God is in communication with your spirit man and the how the spirit man hears God is through that conscious. Your, your conscious is sanctified by the new birth. Your conscious is sanctified uh, by the blood of Jesus. Your conscious is sanctified, uh, made mature by the word of God. Your conscience is sanctified by the spirit of God when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. So now that voice that I get to hear is, is influenced by God. So I'm not, you know, and, and you know, you say it like this. Um, we see the illustration like a little angel on this side and a little devil on this side. And people are vacillating between the two. That's just would be your natural human thing. Because when we taught to do right, your, your conscience is telling you to do the right thing. And, and of course, the, the, the unsaved person, uh, whatever evil or mischief or you know, disobedience, is that other voice uh, to tempt people uh, to do something wrong. We move over to the spirit, to the born again believer. So this would separate just a carnal person, a natural minded person versus a born again believer. And you are open to the word of the Lord now, that spirit. And, and it could come along in, in how do you respond to somebody? Uh, Jesus said, if they slap you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Well, you can't do that unless you say. So the, the reason that I show restraint is not because I'm weak, but because it's predicated on the word of God. You know, you, you, you don't put evil back for evil done to you. You know, you do good and not evil. Why? Because you're trusting that God is going to do it. Uh, uh, take care of those issues. So, again, is it comes from a, a learnedness uh, of what the scriptures say, but in the moment, my response, my, my human response, is predicated on what what is the voice of the Spirit saying on the inside of me. So it's it's simultaneous, it's instantaneous, but but nevertheless, it it originates out of the Spirit of God, and that's why a mature believer, you you have a different behavior maybe than a newborn believer that was still trying to learn and surely different from an unsaved person, even though an unsaved person can be kind, but we're talking about being spiritual, okay? So then secondly, uh, the Spirit leads us in line with the Word of God. So as I take the Word, if you're a believer, but you never read your Bible, never, and you know, I, I use the illustration sometimes when people ask, well, do you have to go to church to be a, a Christian and all that? And the answer is, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, but to be a good Christian, a mature Christian, a learned Christian, reading, studying the Bible, worship, fellowship, and hearing the word, that is a good recipe of becoming a very good Christian. Excuse me. Now, the word presents not just God's opinion, but literally, um, the will of God is, is in his word, the, the whole counsel of God. So not just every story in the Bible and those kind of things, but the principles, the precepts, the laws, all of those fundamentals of the kingdom of God are embedded in the word of God. Because some things are true, uh, you know, because you, you could say like... Uh, things that Judas did or anybody who did something evil, well, you don't just go and do it because it's in the Bible, you know? So we're not just saying every word that's in the Bible, but those things that represent God and what his rightful command and relationship and disposition toward us. So now my spirit has something to feed on and to give me direction because the word says. And so this is why you want to rightly divide the word of God. You want to be preach to and talk to from the scriptures because these are the ones that give you a firm foundation in your relationship with God. And so my response to be godly, I need to have the word of God on the inside of me. Um, and so uh, point number three here, the spirit leads us in line with God's will for your life. So how do I know what is God's will for my life? It's not just what I think, but what does... The, the Bible say about God's will for my life? How, how do I get to know what that is? 
You know, when I'm making a choice for career, a family, or some decision that I'm making, well, what is the will of God for my life? Where, where, where's that written? What chapter, what book is that in the Bible that I can go and find and say, turn to Mark or turn to uh, Ephesians or uh, Colossians and say, where is it in there that's the will of God for my life? How do I find that? It's called the whole counsel of God. God reveals himself uh, corporately and individually through the word of God. Okay. There is not a scripture in here that says Raymond Johnson ought to go do this or that, and that's the will of God for my life. It's based on the counsel of God. It's, it's based on what does God say for every believer? What, what is his desire? Uh, when it comes to health and healing? What is his desire when it comes to prosperity? What is his desire concerning family? What is desire concerning service? So now I, I have this as a foundation, the principles, the whole counsel of, um, in, in, in the Psalms where, where it goes through about the laws, the precepts of God. Psalm 119, which is the longest uh, chapter in the Bible, I think 176 verses, and they really talk about the laws, precepts, commands of God. And so it lays out, just like the rest of the Bible does, what, 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 what does God think about things? What, what is God's disposition about things? And so it gets to shape us. And then from the New Testament, uh, from its epistles and, and letters, etc., then now it sort of shapes what is the will for any believer but then I can fine tune it between the word and the spirit. Now I get to find out, and with prayer, and we'll talk about prayer and the Holy Spirit in a moment, of, of this is how all of these components, I don't have to think through each one and say, okay, now I'm getting the word. Okay, good, I'm getting the spirit. Okay, I'm, I'm getting the revelation. I'm getting the gift. No, it, it comes into the life of the believer. It's more about being aware of it than being able to shine a flashlight on any one portion. Uh, there is a will of God for your life, and, and no matter what it is that somebody else is trying to influence you, or it may be good for another person, you have to know that you know that you know what is the will of God for your life concerning Christ Jesus. Now, does, does it go to every little component of life? Does it tell, you know, what color shirt that I want, you know, where the will of God is for me to put a beige shirt on a brown, whatever color this is that I have in blue? No, I, I picked that. I really did. It did. I don't need God to pick the colors that I do. Now, there are decisions that affect many, many things in my life. That's what I need to know the will of God for. What I'm involved in, how I serve the kingdom of God, uh, what people I'm going to go to and be involved with, these are the will of God for your life. You know? And you're not assigned to everything, and you're not assigned to everybody. So this is where I wait on the Lord. I listen. So the will of God is going to, uh, I'm going to find it. I'm going to be led by it. I'm going to be influenced by it through the Spirit of God. That's how I'm going to know the will of God for my life. The prayer of consecration I talked about with Jesus, that type of prayer also reveals the will of God for your life, and the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And Jesus illustrated it for us so we would know in those times, how am I going to do? I got two choices, Lord Jesus, and I don't know if I'm supposed to do this, I don't know if I'm supposed to do that. Uh, I got this person in my life, is this the will of God for my life or not? You know, should it be in my life or not in my life? Should I do this, you know, uh, you know, I got a career opportunity, but I got to move. I got to leave my church. I got to leave my family and go here. And, no, you need to know the will of God for your life concerning that. And I believe that God helps us and that he will speak to us. And so all the things that we said beforehand, just recognizing the voice of God and how, how, how to hear the voice of the Spirit of God, these are what helps you make. You know, sometimes people make shipwreck by making decisions that later, uh, and, and, it's, and it's amazing, uh, even though sometimes painful, how it is that after we uh, miss what is the will of God for our life, how clear the mistake becomes when we didn't make the right choice. 
you know, it was so up in smoke, I, I can't hardly figure out what it is. And then you make the wrong decision, and then it comes in, it's like, oh, Lord, I should have seen that. Yeah. Everybody's perfect after the fact because it will just be clear, clear, clear that you made the right or the wrong decision afterwards. We're talking about living in the moment, divine God, how do I make it today concerning the things that God have for my life, if it's ministry, if it's serving, if it's doing, whatever it is. So I learned you can't get in a hurry. You don't let people push you. You don't let somebody else give you a deadline. You choose to listen to the voice of God. And when you do, it's a good place. I, I do it all the time. And where I love to be in agreement with people, I'm, I'm always um, mandated. I believe that as a leader and a pastor, I have to follow what I believe the will of God is for my life and, and the people that I'm responsible for. Because you can't just get to make a decision there's a consequence to your decisions. So if you just make any kind of cockamamie thing and, and then it's horrible for everybody connected to you, that's not good for your life or the life of other people. So uh, it's the sincerity and, and the seriousness which you take uh, these kind of decisions. So the more consequential they are to you and the people you are responsible for, uh, we, we ought to weigh it with enough time so that God can speak to us and be convinced this is the will of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And, and being open to the Holy Spirit where he can take us. Sometimes, you know, we, we're human, so, so we are, are creatures of habit and environment and all those kind of things. So my normal propensity or behavior towards something might be my first choice. But if I listen to the Holy Spirit, it, it may change something that I've been accustomed to my whole life. And I have to be pliable enough and willing to listen to the Spirit of God that I can say, God, might not like it, might not be that comfortable, but I really believe, I'm convinced, that, that this is the will of God concerning my life. And so I can't give you an exact how to do on everything, but, but through the uh, conglomeration of all of these things, it's it's going to settle in your spirit. When you know that you know that you know that you know, that's when you know. All right? It's the peace that passes all understanding. And that's what I look for. One of my things is, do I have the peace of God? Because when I'm still going back and forth, and you make it and you can't go to sleep, and then you turn, you know, you're still wrestling with it. You, you sort of decided, but then yet you're still undecided. God gives a peace in the spirit. When you get to that place, that that is the will of God concerning Christ Jesus. And, and you live with it, and you roll with it, okay? All right. Now, the Spirit leads you as you pray in the Holy Ghost. And, of course, English, too. So I, I, I like to uh, make the difference on this. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, um, when, when the spirit, uh, uh, the scripture was uh, revealed to me then, it, it just really gave me an understanding because when I got filled with the spirit, uh, as a young, young believer, didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. And just, you know, you happen to read and learn and be taught and read books and, and commentaries, etc. cetera. And, and then at just spending time with God and, and the Holy Spirit, then you get a chance to be uh, more proficient in these uh, things, but for the spirit-filled believer, it, it is one more tool in your arsenal that God will give you because ultimately we're talking about decisions, we're talking about service, uh, we're talking about consequence for others, especially when you're a leader uh, because your decision won't just affect you, it's going to affect somebody else and you want it to be for good and, and not for bad. Uh, poor decisions cause uh, ramification to others. And so whether you're a leader in your home or business or whatever, you know, if you just go do something, then trust me, it's not just going to be you. It is going to affect somebody else. So in, in the spirit, and, and those of you who are living faith, this is very, very uh, easy listening for you because it, it's what we teach uh, biblically and, and as a pattern of, of uh, the kingdom of God. 
Paul writes a whole chapter here. Well, it's not really a chapter, but this portion of his letter, chapter 14, because remember now, he's writing to the Corinthian church who, um, they're they, they a young group of believers, and, and, and he's written about all, all the things that kind of was, you know, out of order, but he's trying to help folk. But it tells them about the Holy Spirit and, and, and how to integrate this into their life in a practical way. So sometimes when people talk about just praying in the spirit or moving in the spirit, and they think about just a balloon being blown up, and you just kind of let it go, and then wherever it lands, that's kind of, no, no, no. God is very calculating. That's why he wrote the Bible. He's very precise. See, not one jot or tittle of the word is going anywhere. So he's not just a spur of the moment God. He knows the end from the beginning. So I, I tell people when he wrote the Bible, God was wise enough to put everything that we would need to deal with is in the Bible. Everything. Nothing is left out. We believe it's the whole counsel of God and that God is so wise he put everything in here that we need. Now, we need the revelation of it because your name is not just written on it, but it's for believers. It's for folks. So here it is. Paul says, uh, for him that speaketh, verse 2, who speaketh or prayeth, what would be proper here, in an unknown tongue, speak or pray not to men but to God. But no man understandeth him, how be in the spirit he speaks mysteries or unknown words or concepts, okay? If he prays in an unknown tongue, um, he edifies himself. He that prophesied speaks to men to edification. He that speak, verse 4, in an unknown tongue edifies himself. The word edify here means to build up. But he that prophesied edified the church. So he's speaking of the value of both things, of prophecy and speaking in tongues and or praying in tongues. And so, of course, this affected the church service. And it was, everything was out of order in this church. If you go back and read the whole book, it just got, it, it was trying to help them to get it together. Move, move to verse 13. He says, wherefore, let him that speak it in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So, so here, here, here it is right here. The value of praying or speaking in the Holy Spirit is, he said, if you do that, then we understand the difference between, and so we don't make a whole less about uh, the message in tongue and the gift of the Spirit uh, of speaking in tongues and all those things. Because here, uh, the consistency and, and, and the context it's really about praying in the Spirit because we get it for the next verse. He said, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit pray. So that connects with verse 13. So let him that speak it or pray in an unknown tongue pray that he will interpret. So, yeah, I'm praying in the Spirit. But, yeah, it's building up my spirit. He said, but, but my intellect is unfruitful. So the purpose of praying in the Holy Spirit for the believer is that it speaks directly to God. Uh, it was over in uh, Book of Romans, chapter 8, uh, how the Holy Spirit helps you infirmity, praying in the Spirit. Here, he says, if I pray in the unknown tongue, my spirit pray, but my understanding is unfruitful. So I want to know. I want to know. That's why he said, pray that you interpret. Why? Because I need to, uh, eventually, I need to know what am I praying about. So it takes the limitations off of your vocabulary. It takes the limitation off your intellect. We only know so much. Our praying in the spirit, which is why we call this divine guidance, and this is a little bit mature, because I don't know everything I'm supposed to do. I don't know everything that's going to come in front of me. I don't know what next week holds. I don't know what next year holds. But particularly if you're a leader anywhere, you have to have divine guidance because how are you going to lead folk if you don't know where you're going? How are you going to lead your family if you don't know where you're going? How are you going to lead your business? How are you going to lead whatever it is, responsibility, your area of ministry that God give you? What, what is it in the kingdom, in your vineyard, in your field that you're supposed to be doing? How can you be successful if you don't know what you're supposed to do? And you can't just copy something. You know, 
Too many times in the kingdom of God, people just copy what they see other people doing. Well, so-and-so did it, Reverend so-and-so did it, this church did it, so I'm going to do it over here. And, and, and really, it, it robs us of that direct intervention, impartation of, the, of our great heavenly father to make sure you have exactly what you need. So some things are good, but they're not expedient. That's, that's how the Bible calls it. In other words, they're not for you. They're not specific for you. So the way that I know for my household, I need to make sure I'm getting the will of God. Now, not my grocery list, or what color to get furniture, but that will be things of consequence connected to the spirit. I need to know what God says for me and my family and those who connected with me. Because as we said before, your decision have consequence for others. Amen. Oh, you know, the Lord told me just get up, leave everything I got here, move to California, go move to Alaska, and he's going to meet me there and do something. Okay, good. Pray in the Holy Ghost. I'm not saying he, he didn't tell you to say it, to do it, but you better believe if God told you, don't get over there and fail or, or make your family suffer or lose everything that you work for based on something psychological whim or somebody else did it. And so this is the seriousness of this divine guidance, praying in the spirit, being aware of the spirit, properly interpreting the word of God, because in our everyday life, we have to navigate things that many days are routine. Do the same thing, get up, go to work, do the same thing. But then there are days when we hit a crossroad and the decision that you have to make, the choices that is before you will affect you to some degree. I tell people, when you're getting in debt, you need to pray in the Holy Ghost. You signing your name or something, pray in the Spirit. Because, you know, debt is a weight, but it needs to be a proper weight. So I believe that naturally people could just do it, yeah, but for a Christian, uh, what you have is not your own. So I want to make sure I'm not violating God uh, by saying, God, I put everything in your hand. I, I trust you for everything. And so the way that I'm supposed to acquire and things that I'm supposed to be with, I, I don't want to limit what I can do for the kingdom of God based on not involving God even in those kind of decisions in my life. I, I just believe when, when Peter got ready to pay his taxes, the Lord told him, take your pole, go over there, there's a fish. He said, when you lift that fish up, there's going to be some gold in his mouth, pay your taxes and mine. So I believe that God know how to supernaturally meet our debt. It is. He didn't say, well, I'm God. I don't have to pay taxes. No, as the man, Jesus Christ, he owed taxes just like Peter did. But he's showing us there's a supernatural provision. Now, he had other monies because Judas had the bag, but this was an example of how you listen to the Spirit of God. Who told Jesus it was the fish? with gold in his mouth. How many fish you ever caught with gold in your mouth? I've never, <laughs> never. But I believe the scripture. I believe the provision. Uh, it was with the widow in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18 when, when, when Elijah was there and, and the word of the Lord, the way that God guided him, he took care of both of them and her son by just, here's an opportunity to obey. Naturally, she had enough for one meal supernaturally it was enough to take care of her until the famine lifted. It's the little boy with the loaves and the fishes. It's supposed to be a meal for a boy, but it was a meal for thousands. So him giving it up and them trusting uh, the Lord in these things. And so, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a little press on your faith, but as you read the Bible and believe the Bible, then you're going to find out that, that God doesn't have the limitation on him that we have a, on us as humans. And there is a place when the man's uh, servant was sick, and, and he's, 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 he's a Gentile, and, and, but, but he has enough faith in God. He hears God and says, you don't have to come to my house. If you speak the word, my servant will be here. Where did he get that from? That is the spirit of God. So not only can, and in normal times, the spirit speaks to believers, but the Lord can speak to unbelievers. Uh, when when Philippian, uh, uh, Philip was with the eunuch, he was sitting there reading. He became aware of the Spirit of God. Whatever he told him to do, that's what he was going to do. Change his whole life. He was close, 
but not in the kingdom, and God provided. So the Bible is just filled with practical things of God's intervention in our lives, in the lives of people that make great um, benefit for us when we obey. All right, I want to go through this last one because I want to conclude this uh, series of lessons, and, and I've really been enjoying it, but I like the practical. It's good to know, you know, all, all the nuances of Scripture and how you tie all these things. How can I use this every day? How do I get up in the morning and use what I'm being taught right now in a practical way that will cause the blessing of God? Because we say God is on our side. Can't just sing it. Yeah, the Lord is on our side. He, he's our present help. How do I use that present help every day? All right, good. Well, he is the shepherd, and, and that's my final point. Uh, he is the shepherd, and the shepherd is the one that's responsible uh, for the sheep. So we gave you any number, and I'll just give you these uh, reference scriptures uh, because by now we, we've kind of covered some of those. Ezekiel chapter 34, um, verse 26, and following because I put the wrong number at the end. I put 26, 26, but it goes further than that. So 26 and following of Ezekiel 34, then Psalm 23, which is a beautiful Psalm of David. And he said, the Lord is my shepherd. And then he leaded me beside the still walk, talking about being led by the spirit of God. And then of course, in John chapter 10, where Jesus talks about the good shepherd and he draws the distinction between a true shepherd and a hireling. A number of other scriptures, but let me just close with this. And the Lord gave it to me this morning. Um, Galatians chapter 6. And, you know, sometimes I get a thought or something drop in my spirit. I'm thinking, well, you know, there's something, you know, the Lord want me to teach or preach on or whatever. But I just felt like it, it was just like a word to me today. And, and that it was just like a kingdom word. But I take it personally. Verse 9, it says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We heard it a million times. But then look at the next verse. This is what the Holy Spirit dropped on me today. He said, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. And so for the last number of weeks, we've been involved in ourselves and helping people, helping churches, helping pastors uh, recover from uh, the devastation of Hurricane Ida. And, and so just in my natural mind, I'm trying to navigate, move, go here, do this, give that. And you know, I'm trying to you know, make sure, Lord, you know, is this you speaking to me? And I, if I find a pastor needs this, mid and I, we've been just taking out of our own monies and, and making sure we, we are blessing because we've been that place before. We've been where our home was flooded, church was flooded, and our members were, uh, so many of them, a large percentage, was affected. And so I still remember what that felt like to be in that moment where you just need, and we had insurance, and that was going to be a good thing, but it, it's, insurance doesn't take away the suffering. Insurance doesn't pay back all the memories, you know, all your photo albums or things like that, things you lose, and uh, just the discomfort and, and, and the, uh, all the things you have to navigate through. And so when I heard that today, and it was just kind of a reminder, don't get weary in what you're doing. Uh, look for every opportunity. He, he said, we, we ought to do this as believers uh, because we're, we're reaching to, you know, how can we help the seniors? How can we help... Uh, some of the low income people who have needs in their life, they just don't have it. What, what can you do as a ministry, as an individual, to be a helper? And then, you know, what, while we're trying to make sure we're reaching out, but God said, listen, but don't be afraid to do it for the body of Christ, especially to the household of faith. That means to believers. When believers are hurting, churches are hurting, pastors are hurting, uh, uh, people who serve in ministry, when they're hurting, Whatever we can do. Now, sometimes it's collective. We took an offering, and our people are very, very generous here, and we've been distributing and making sure, uh, as well as we can uh, uh, be good stewards over it, that it's getting to places where believers that maybe have no connection to us at all, some of the pastors, some of the members of churches we've been uh, connecting and sowing into, never met them in my life. It's just God's divine providence of crossing 
path with either people who helping serve or doing a part. Like I told them, I can't get on the roof anymore. I probably can get up. It's the getting down <laughs> that I don't want to have to do. But we find other ways that we can serve. And so maybe you can't take off your job and go pull sheetrock or pull carpet up or nail or mud or, or do something, put a shingle on the house. But we can give, we can serve, we can provide. We, we can do many, many things in our lives. So not just for me only, but for all of us, let us do good to all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. So now, Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me. I can't do it for everybody. I don't know everybody on the planet, but I believe that God is going to make you aware who those individuals are and what are those unique situations that you can say, I believe that God is telling me to help. Find a way to be a blessing. Don't have to be Hurricane Ida. Could be on your street, could be in the school. Maybe you do something and bring something for the school teacher. Many of them having to use their own monies. Put a little envelope, put a few dollars in there. You know the teacher buying supplies out of their own monies. Give them $10, $20 and say, this will just help you with the school supplies because I know the school system doesn't provide everything that my child benefits from. So we give where we've been blessed. We give where we believe that God is showing up. Why? Because we representatives of the kingdom. Whether we ever get credit or pats on the back from the world, we do it as unto the Lord. And I close with this. God brings me back to this so many times. What, what is the genuineness of Christianity? It's not what Bible we use or the format of the service or the songs we sing, uh, all those things. Jesus said, listen, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. He says, real Christianity is doing for people that have a need. Do it to them. You've done it to me. Be led by the Spirit and let the Lord show you. In, in my final closing, uh, if you're not saved, if you've not given your heart to Jesus Christ, what would you take this opportunity and believe that God is speaking? We said being led by the Spirit, it's his desire that none would perish, but that all would come into a knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, just call him. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I want to be saved. I trust in Christ that he gave his life that I might have eternal life. And if you call on him, you will be saved. We can help you. Uh, just in the comment line, you can write down, I'm born again. I received Jesus. Or maybe you just call the church office at 225-357-0377. Call them. Say, I was listening to the broadcast and I gave my heart to Jesus. What is my next step? in my walk with Jesus Christ. We'd love to help you. So either in the comment line, right here while you're watching, Facebook, YouTube, or whatever, or if you want to reach out to us uh, through our office telephone, uh, Monday through Friday, or the other ways that you'll be able to see. Listen, we want to help you in a strong walk with God. I want to invite you to our Sunday morning worship service every nine, every Sunday, 930 here at 6375 Winburn, right here in the middle of the city of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We'd love for you to come and be our very, very, very special guest. Amen. Well, I want to close the service, let you know we love you. Turn it over to Pastor Will. He's going to show you how you can give and be a blessing to the kingdom of God and to us here at Living Faith. Amen. Well, amen. As Bishop said, it's time to give at Living Faith Christian Center. For those who would like to give electronically, you can simply go to our website, www.livingfaith-cc.org, and you'll see a tab that says Donate. Click on that tab, and the fields will open up where you can enter in the information that's necessary for you to begin to give electronically. Also, for those of you who would like to text to give, you can text any dollar amount that you would like to phone number 225 239-4229. Again, that phone number is 225-239-4229. For those of you who would like to mail your tithe and your offering or you want to send a special seed into the ministry, you can make your check or money order payable to LFCC. And you can send that to Living Faith Christian Center, 6375 Winborne Avenue, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70805. And last but not least, for those of you that live in the Baton Rouge and surrounding areas and you would like to bring your tithe and offering to our physical location here at 6375 Woodborne Avenue, 
on located on the west side of our building, you will see a tithing offer receptacle box filled with tithing offer and envelopes, which you can fill out while you're standing there. And once you're finished filling it out, you'll see the tithing offer and mail slot that you can place your tithing offering in. And as always, we thank God for the seeds that you sow into this ministry. And we believe that what you sow shall come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. We believe God for increase in every area of your life because he said that he's the God that shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let us have the final prayer on tonight. Father God, in the name of Jesus, as we leave this place, we never leave your presence. Continue to make your face shine down on us and bless us as your people. Give your angels charge over our lives to keep us in all of our ways. And we be forever careful to give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. See you Sunday at 930, and then we'll be right back here next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for our Bible study. God bless you. God keep you as I pray. Good night.